It's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Shows that make you laugh. Shows that make you think. Music that moves you. It can only be one place. Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at UBNRadio.com. Welcome to Both Sides Now. Featuring the unconventional duo, Dr. Shirley and medium Kelly White. Two perspectives, one world. This is Both Sides Now. Hi, and welcome to Both Sides Now. I'm Dr. Shirley. And I'm medium Kelly White. And we have John, our engineer, with us tonight. Well, hello, hello, ladies. Yay! <laughs> so tonight we have a fantastic show. We have Dr. Diane Poole-Heller on tonight. And let me just read a little bit about her because she's fascinating. She's an established expert in the field of trauma resolution. Diane is noted for her ability to communicate complex topics with humor and clarity, and she sure does. Her workshops feature interactive lectures, multimedia presentations, and live demonstrations in actual healing sessions. She started working with, you know, my fave, Dr. Peter Levine, who I love, love, love. He's the founder of Somatic Experiencing Training Institute, and she started with him in 1989. She has lectured and taught around the world somatic experiencing, and she created her own program called DARE, Dynamic Attachment Repattering Experience, which helps people heal their attachment ruptures. Wow. Yeah, so welcome, Diane. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm so excited. And she's joining us live from Hawaii, right? I know. You are joining us from Hawaii. If you were here, you'd be able to see that audience that's hiding right. behind us. <laughs> Diane, Beautiful. before we get in, in any further, I'm just curious, how in the world, it's such an amazing spiritual path, how in the world did you get here? Oh my gosh, that's a long story. Let's see if I give you the highlights. I never knew I would be have anything to do with um, teaching trauma for 25 years and having the good fortune to uh, have Peter Levine as my mentor and mentor and learning so much from him. And and then I've been so excited to dive into the attachment work, you know, really making that a practical experience for people in terms of how to heal their histories. And uh, it started in kind of a strange way. I uh, had an automobile accident in 1988, literally two weeks before I was getting married. I had a head-on collision. I was going 55 one way, and the other guy was going 55 the other way, so impacted 110 miles an hour. So wow. Not, Did you, you know, have a head injury? I broke the windshield with my head. You know, it was a really, I was actually, you know, working on getting ready for the wedding and had this, like, little porcelain, little porcelain figurine that my soon-to-be mother-in-law had given me, so it was like a family tradition sort of thing. So I, it started to slide off my notebook and I was trying to protect it. So I took my seatbelt off and reached for it and then turned the wheel, you know? So oh. not only did I have the impact without a seatbelt, but that was just really wow. opened me up to having what brain injury was all about and car accident, high impact shock. And then it opened up my own personal trauma history. So I kind of went on this whole search over the country of who to find that could help me with all of this. And eventually after a long search found peter levine which was really mm. such a gift and yeah wow it's, it's so interesting me. diane i also had a head injury getting Oops. into my car and it's so interesting to me how we all people who have had survived head injuries how the different paths that we've taken and i would say that yours is certainly a spiritual one yeah it, it really i had been on a you know my own spiritual path before that but it really opened up all sorts of awarenesses for me and then also a really deep appreciation for in so many ways how much unnecessary suffering there was when we were dealing with trauma and that how much we didn't really know very much about mm -hmm. how to really help people with trauma on a physiological level which is really well so much of where it lives and um it was one you know how you have these kind of awful things happen but they turn out to be really gifts and yeah. and uh give you so much wisdom in the long run or so much teaching so that that was a long journey and i get the chance to really deepen my understanding of it teaching it for 25 years over 25 years and i'm still now really focusing on relational trauma with really understanding the attachment underpinnings that really in a way are the foundation even before we're old enough to have even more life events happen to us in terms of those kinds of things, car accidents, surgeries, assaults, whatever might come down the road, uh, natural disasters. 
that re- I found out how significant your attachment history, your kind of relational template is as an underpinning or a foundation for how you respond to later traumas. And what we know now is that having secure attachment or getting back to secure attachment from an attachment difficulty gives you a tremendous amount of resilience against PTSD, either getting symptoms or actually recovering from them much, much more quickly. So there's a really important kind of marriage made in heaven between those two bodies of knowledge. Oh, absolutely. And I'm so, so excited that you've, that you, you know, are dedicating your life to study them and to, and to teach all of us about it. Why don't you give us an overview of the different attachment patterns and, um, you know, how they start as a child and what they look like as adults? Definitely. I would love to do that. Um, first of all, why study trauma and attachment? And from my vantage point, I really look at trauma and attachment difficulties in the very, very beginning, even starting in utero, are sort of the biggest issues, not the only ones, but big ones in terms of what block us from our natural capacity to be present, Mm -hmm. um, really know ourselves in our most natural state of love and compassion and our being present in our own lives and permeable and vulnerable to what happens to us. So when we switch the focus to attachment, uh, first of all, we want to know what secure attachment is. That's where we're all trying to get back to, right? Right. If we didn't have the, hit the jackpot of having it to begin with. And yeah. of course, they say about 51% of the population is in secure wow. attachment. Wow. And they say that's mm-hmm. dropping, actually. The recent research shows that we're d- down down to about 45%. Well, so I have to, I have want to go the other direction, yeah. right? So I'm really committed to that. I think it's one of the fastest ways we can heal as individuals and in our relationships. And life is really enriched by relationship. And I mean, if you take this the broad picture, we're looking at even how countries interrelate and how, you know, all different cultures interrelate and how families interrelate. So I just think it's a really fast track to healing if we can really help ourselves. Well, and I shift have to this s- sooner than later. You yeah, know? I have to say, I mean, not that I I'm, you know, against technology, but I have to say that the, the the cell phone and being able to get distracted on the cell phone when a mother is feeding her baby is can be a huge culprit to why oh, that number's yeah. going down. And maybe you can help, you know, our listeners understand what I mean by that, Diane. Well, I think there might be two reasons. I mean, back in the 50s, I was kind of raised, you know, I was born in 54, so I was raised in the 50s and 60s. You know, most of us had the luxury of having one career families, you know. So there yeah. was one parent, usually moms, uh, were home. So there was a lot more availability. In some cases, that was good. In some cases, that might have even been challenging, right? But there was a lot of more of a parental presence uh it wasn't, you know, it was easier to have access to the family that way. And then now we have this whole birth of technology, which, gosh, I mean, I was born before TV. Now I've got kids asking me, were you born before the computer? And of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, though, you know. And they say now that the people that are really important to you are the people that you give your face-to-face time, your actual face, not Facebook, yeah. you know, your actual mm-hmm. face. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I think technology connects us globally. I mean, we couldn't even do what we're doing today without technology, which is fabulous. Yeah. But then there's this part that we're not maybe developing the prefrontal cortex enough by what you really have to have is touch, you know, actual Mm -hmm. safe, cuddly touch, skin to skin touch, and also eye contact to eye contact that's actually in present time, like with you in the moment. And that's getting challenged a bit by all of the gizmos that we're also connected to. So it's tricky. Yeah. I think in the, in the past, you know, when I grew up, I had, you know, my dad worked and my mom didn't, but she didn't, we didn't know about how important eye to eye contact was. And so I remember the bottle would be propped so she can go off and finish cooking or doing what she was doing. Now I think mothers are looking at their phone while they're feeding the baby and they don't realize that that eye to eye contact, those moments of connection, particularly during feeding time are so important and can be so pro- are so profound for the baby. You know, I heard one uh, attachment expert speak about that when you're actually taking in food as an infant, as you're taking in the milk or whatever it is, you're also imbibing the energy in the presence of the of your mother or the yeah. mothering presence. Sometimes Completely. it's a dad, right? Oh, but yeah. but you're you're literally taking in their presence, and if they're not present, that's what you're taking in. You're taking in absence. Yeah. Like yeah. so, even the genesis of eating disorders, I think 
can tie back into this when there's just been a lot of disruption, even in regulation or actual eating, you know, how eating happened and how, how um, you know, the, whether it was contact or not. But the thing is, this is so teachable. Yeah. If you sat down with a group of mothers and just, just said what you said, it would be so easy to correct that, right? And if they knew that, they would they could very easily put the cell phone down and make an effort to be in you know, safe physical contact and in an emotional space that's nurturing and with eye contact. Well, it, it's a- not hard to do. Yeah. We're hardwired right. to do it. Well, absolutely. And that's why I, you know, that's why I think it's so important to get it out. It's not that people don't want to, but if you, you don't know what you don't know. I, exactly. I, I completely agree with you that telling a parent how important that just that feeding time alone is, I, I have, mm-hmm. I know that they would drop their phone and do that, but right. we just don't know. Exactly. So yeah. let's see if we can, like you asked me before to kind of do an overview and I want yeah. to do that. Let's see yeah, if we yeah. can give some people some information that's super practical and just maybe demystifies this a little bit. Absolutely. Right? Like what works, what doesn't work. Um, would you like me to dive in? Uh, yeah, please do. Okay. Secure attachment, uh, first of all, it has a lot to do with touch, cuddling, hugging, combing hair, rubbing feet. You know, really this kind of, I like to call it gourmet contact nutrition. Thinking oh, of it like, like food, emotional yeah. food, but also phys- it regulates the nervous system. It helps your you actually feel your body, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Regulates yeah. your sleep, your eating, all of your digestion, all of those things. And actually, one of the most important things in uh, developing secure attachment is play. Learning yeah. to play, be interactively connected in play. So, the, you know, it might look like, I don't know, you're watching even a movie, but you're actually discussing it or talking about it or snuggling while you're watching the movie or, you know, doing a foot rub while you're watching the movie. So you're in contact. You're not just zoning out as a isolated person looking at the TV screen, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So how you can actively, interactively play, parents being present, obviously, presence no matter what, whether we're therapists or parents or whatever, mm-hmm. presence is going to be the most important common denominator. Um, being protective and knowing mm-hmm. when to protect when the child can't do it themselves, right, depending on their age. Mm-hmm. So you're not intruding on their own self-protection, but you're, you, they have the feeling that, you know, you have their back, right, right. and that they're, they know you're sort of a sentinel. You're paying attention. You have this protective kind of um, feeling. You're consistent. You're reliable, trustworthy, um, There's sort of an easy, relaxed flow between the child needing some alone time and then coming back into contact with you. Like they can go out and explore a little bit. You'll notice when a kid has safe haven, they have curiosity. And one of the signals that somebody's in secure attachment is that they can connect, but they also have this kind of exploratory energy, this curiosity to go out and check out the world. And then they know they can, you know, run back to mom or dad, get a little bit of like a pit stop, you know, a little fuel uh, of connection and safety, and then they go back out and explore again right right. and we even need that as adults when we feel safe with a partner or safe with friends or you know Mm -hmm. safe in our work environment whatever that our ability to not have the constant question in the brain of am i safe which that actually cycles every four seconds they say if you're not sure you're constantly scanning for safety and do i belong and does somebody like me and do i fit in if you can solve those questions so the brain can shift into a creative mode man we just live out so much more of our potential Mm -hmm. yeah so true yeah. I mean, it's really the whole the reason we're here is for our soul to experience wonderful love and compassion and freedom and all of these things. And the work that you're doing and that you're talking to us about today is extraordinary. It really frees the soul. If you can give them the touch and the secure attachment, yeah. then they can go forth with what they came here to do. Yeah. I think that's really true. I think it actually takes us into our soul mission, if you will, or, mm-hmm. or living our true potential as a human being. And trauma and attachment now also they can be gifts of learning right so sure. sometimes i think yeah. we sign up from yeah. the universe and oh, learn some absolutely tough stuff and then you we betcha. we learn it from from sort of like like how bad it was we learn like the opposite you know <laughs> right. so it's so weird true. but when we start to clear that and heal that then we have this incredible um transformative wisdom that also yeah. seems to seep in you know and it's exciting to see that and i i mean that's the privilege of being a, as you know, being a therapist or being, you know, in your work, Kelly, as a medium, you're in this intimate place with people oh, and, yeah. and really help them, help them see for themselves what, what is really the truth for them. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so many times in what I see as a medium and as a psychotherapist are problems with the mother connecting with the child. Yes. And, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, mostly it was the moms that stayed at home. But now they, I like this, they've changed the term to mothering presence. So that could be a nanny, it could be grandmother, could be an older sibling, Mm -hmm. could be a father. But whoever was in that role, 
they have a really strong impact on oh even in utero, right? Even the yeah, relationship yeah. between mom and dad while the baby's in gestation yes. is mm -hmm. getting absorbed like a giant sponge. And as soon as the baby's out, they're absorbing not only their individual That's relationship true. with mom and dad, but also the relationship of mom and dad together, like yeah, what's yeah. happening with them. And they're mm -hmm. also absorbing culture. Let's like just a little sponge. And, and as mom and dad, you're kind of the star of their show, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're just imbibing all of that. And we don't want to also minimize the fact that there's medical procedures when people are born. So sometimes it's not so much about the mom or dad, but it has to do with yeah. if there was a medical uh, intrusion, maybe necessary to save someone's life. But sometimes that medical need or medical habit, you know, or pattern will actually disrupt attachment. So there's, you know, different yeah. things going on. But it's so it, what's so cool, I think, and so optimistic is that we can go back in and touch into those times and spaces, those windows of opportunity, and then meet the needs that we can do it, you know, in, in therapy, or sometimes this happens in our, you know, context of our significant relationships, mm -hmm. primarily our partners or, you know, significant friends, and that this can come back. It's like we're designed, John Bowlby, wow. all the way back to John Bowlby, yeah. is we're designed for secure attachment. Now, some of us have a lot of stuff dumped on top of that that we have to clear off, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's not like we have to make it happen. It's there. We have to resurrect it in a way, right? And 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 support it enough. I mean, when I think of this in terms of doing therapy, um, we're so good at excavating wound. I mean, as psychotherapists, we've been really taught like yeah. how to get the wound up, right? Mm -hmm. But I think equally important, or 50% of the time, if you want to make a percentage, is we have to also be addressing how to nourish the secure attachment system and the strength of, of the health of the person so that that mm -hmm. starts to dominate over the wound. I love how you present that, that it's already there. It's already part of our system, and we need to excavate it and pull it out if it's kind of been, unfortunately, mm -hmm. shoved down or dormant because of our experiences. Right, right. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. So the attachment adaptations are kind of a, a map to how that might happen. And mm -hmm. you could have a mix of them. You could have one element of one of them. You know, it's just, just your, whatever your particular experience was. But, but the tricky part of trauma and attachment is they both happen in what's called fast circuit learning. And they go immediately into implicit memory, which is sub-psychological, oh. pre-verbal, uh, non-cognitive memory. And so when we touch into those states, whether it's unresolved trauma or whether it's early attachment, whatever comes up in someone's experience feels like the eternal now. It feels like they're in it as if it's ha happening now, which is a different kind of memory. And we want to touch into that. We have to kind of trigger it. We have to do something to, to help it come up. And then it becomes explicit. They become aware of it and they can start to move through it. But if you want, I can go over a little bit what happens in avoidant attachment, yes, and then we can look at, you know, how we might touch into that and bring it up and help a person move through it. Yeah. And same for ambivalent and a bit undisorganized. Mm -hmm. Avoidant is, um, now these aren't sequential. These are all happening at the same time. They're all, when in attachment theory, it's not like this happens at this month and this happens at that month. They're all happening. These are just different patterns that come out of in utero experience and the early um, two, two, three, four years of, you know, uh, your original connection in terms of relationship. And then they can be altered later in life because the attachment system is oriented to the environment. It will shift based on the environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're looking at what the early imprint was, but knowing that it can shift. That's the whole point. We just really want to highlight that because it's a very optimistic under uh, view of how we can heal. I mean, I think we're designed to heal this. So yeah. I just want people to really hear that, even though I'm going to talk now about like what didn't work so well. Okay. So avoidant often happens when uh, the main significant relationship person, and of course you could have one attachment style with one parent and one attachment style with another one based on how they're treating or interacting with you. But if one of the parents was particularly not present, so you get kind of the feeling that you're trying to connect with someone that's not there, which is like nobody there, or they're too often not there, or someone that's actively rejecting, or uh, what they found now is that if they're only really showing up, being present when they're teaching you some kind of task. So in that time when you're present, there's like, teaching you to read or teaching, nothing wrong with teaching, right? But if you're not also there present emotionally and mirroring back your special to me and having good safe touch and a prosody in the voice that's modulated and soothing, 
um, then you're still kind of getting a little bit too left brain, right? The left brain's getting heavy, <laughs> partly because there's not enough right to right uh, contact to really develop an emotional sense of yourself and, and uh, being present in your own memories in a personally felt way. What will happen, it even affects memory when a person's not interacting with you too much, enough limbic to limbic, brain, right brain to right brain, enough, then even your memory is affected. You have to have enough juice in the emotional connection to actually make emotionally felt memory. Mm -hmm. So people will, you can tell sometimes where someone's attachment pattern is oriented mostly just by the way they tell their narrative. First of all, avoidance tend to have very few words. They tend to report facts. They're very factual, logical. Um, there's sort of a missing vividness in terms of that kind of coloring of emotional context. And, and that can come back, especially when that be, gets attuned to. I just talked to some experts in uh, Copenhagen this week, uh, Marianna Benson and Susan Hart, and they were talking that also what's happening in this early attachment is that we're trying to synchronize on an autonomic nervous system level, an autonomic level. So that can even be like sharing your experience, like going out and say, oh, look, there's a blade of grass with a ladybug on it. And you're drawing somebody into this moment to moment presence and experience of what's happening together, you know, as a parent and a child. And you're, you're sharing emotion like, oh, that makes me feel really sad. Or I wonder if that makes you feel sad. And you're, you're doing this kind of even the eye contact, right, can be a sense of I, I see you, right? You're special to me. There's an ice. I call it a beam gleam. You give somebody, oh. you know, you can do that in like two seconds. You can be at a party like with your partner now or with your friends and they're my, on the other side of the room and you can just shoot them a beam gleam like you're special to me. You mm -hmm. can even do this with your dog and it's amazing the response you'll get. It's just like yeah. sending a little just you're special to me look, mm -hmm. you know? You know mm -hmm. that look when you stop by one of your friends, they don't know you're coming over and they open the door and they go, oh my gosh, it's you. And they just yeah. kind of beam. Yeah. It's and the look know. I give you every day we work together, Shirley. <laughs> yes, <laughs> say, you do. I do. You get beam gleamed all the time. <laughs> That's, right. yeah. That's way cool. But you know that feeling of like, oh, they really, they really want, they're really excited to see me. That's just like total gourmet contact nutrition for your attachment yeah. system. Yeah. Attachment system loves that. And, and that's, you can teach people to pay attention to this. Like even taking a hug long enough, you know, where you're, when you're coming home from work or you're meeting each other in the morning as colleagues or whatever, and you're doing an actual body to body hug, not like this pyramid hug that a lot of us as Americans do. <laughs> you know, we kind of do this like touch a little bit, but we don't really, you know, it has to be appropriate to the person and the level of intimacy. But, but even that, that is another way that we can bring people back into secure attachment. It's just like knowing what's secure attachment and how do we get there? How do we turn it into a skill that we can actually practice, right? So what do people with avoidant attachment look like as adults? Like what characteristics well, would what you will see happen, and, and this is, a, I have a little bit of a pet peeve about this because so often in the writing about avoidant attachment, people are saying things like, well, don't get in a relationship with those people because they don't really care about relationships. <laughs> I mean, I heard, actually heard an attachment expert say that about two weeks really? ago in their workshop and I was like, what? You wow. Know? I thought that was true. It's, it's not. <laughs> no. It's not true. I want to I really, if you get one takeaway, this is not true about avoidance. Avoidance want contact and do love their partners or their families or their pets or their friends, but their way of surviving a non contactful or rejecting initial childhood that gave them a relationship template that says, Nobody's going to be there for you. You need to do everything yourself. Um, Nobody is there when you try to connect and you can't rely on people. You can't trust people. They have the same longing for connection anybody else does. And, as, and, and in therapy or even in a relationship, you know, one of the things we need to do is bring that longing up. And, if, and when the longing comes up, it's initially going to be very painful because the expectation is if I let myself want this, I'm going to get creamed or nothing's going to happen. And then I'm going to be left hanging, you know, in this yeah. isolation. And so what we're trying to correct there is allowing that longing to come up. And then this time, either through a partner or a friend or a therapist, right, they're getting met and really somebody's there and you're correcting that, the longing actually being met with nourishment instead of met with nothing or met with rejection or met with just tasking. Mm -hmm. And that can happen, that will happen if you create the right environment. And sometimes you have to point it out to people, you have to be explicit about it so that they can actually feel the nourishment of interactively regulating. Because if you didn't have anybody there for you, part of the problem is we're social beings, we're designed 
designed for connection. Yeah. And our, our nervous system, if nobody's there enough and they're not there in a loving, caring, kind way enough, then the nervous system doesn't even learn that it's possible really to interactively regulate. And, but you can teach that. It's a teachable thing. Just like yeah. you can learn to self-regulate. I mean, avoidance right. tend to only self-regulate, but they're not really self-regulating. They're dissociatively regulating. Wow. And usually that's by too much TV or too much internet or one night stands without commitment mm -hmm. or, you know, they're zoned out in their own little world. But the reason that happened, the reason they're in that isolated bubble is because no one was there. So our challenge is to get a window or a door open in that bubble, but this time meet them with the good stuff. The beam gleam, the, um, the counter experience to what they built their worldview and sense of self on. And that is possible. That's what's so cool about it. This is really the heart of my work. It's like, okay, how do you figure out what the deepest wound is and then create corrective experiences yeah. that take people back into that initial vulnerability, even though it's not going to feel really like taking a risk, but then you meet them with the right stuff. And then their secure attachment goes, finally. Right. Yeah. And you'll see people. I mean, I've seen this with my clients. I can tell you client stories if we had time. We need more time. But um, th th where they just mold into the person or they just their deep relaxation. And then they start. I had this one guy who, who said he goes, I can reach out. He was reaching. He didn't even know why he was reaching. He was reaching with like little infant hand kind of because we're really deep in, in the early years. And he was reaching and he goes, it's so strange. It doesn't feel futile. I feel like someone's there. Now, this comes mm. from someone who never felt like anybody was there. His mother died at a very early, it really, wow. a, few, a few months after he was a C-section, and she was depressed wow. before that. And his father, we became overwhelmed with grief because of losing his wife. But he started to have, and this was coming from just his internal physiology was changing. And you have to work on that level, which yeah. is a point I want to make is we have to work on a somatic level because it lives in the physiology. Just like trauma, so much of it lives in the physiology. It's much more a physiological issue in a way than a psychological issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can both mm -hmm. be at play. And it's a spiritual issue too. I think yeah, all of it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But that's so because... I find it exciting. I think it's just oh, such yeah. a privilege to go back in there and help this come back because... It's so impressive to who we are as human beings, our incredible resiliency. And you're saying that, just to clarify, that it's, that it's in the physiology because these things affect our brain and our nervous system. Yes, and, it, and, and the, the way memory is working on an implicit level is it's very much somatized, embodied. Mm -hmm. And um, so part of the challenge with avoidance is to help them find their bodies again because part of their dis avoidance tend to associate a lot they often don't feel their bodies very much they don't feel mm -hmm. their emotions very much but that's partly because they had this autonomic deficit by this feeling of nobody being there in a nourishing way and if you can correct that they can start mm -hmm. to experience people as nourishing all of that starts to get juiced up again and all of a sudden they're approaching people they don't know why they're doing it this behavior just starts changing where normally approach is very stressful for an avoidant all of a sudden they're saying things to people that are more emotional that they've never said before and they're almost like who said that you know it right. just starts to shift almost on an unconscious level and yeah. they just start doing things they never did before it's so beautiful yeah. I, I mean it's to me it's such a validation for all of us how much we're designed for healing and transformation yeah but we have to so have the true. right the right the right food you know in a way the right nourishment for that to happen because remember the attachment system scanning the environment and and really orienting to what the relational field is. Mm -hmm. And as a therapist, I think you have to be trained in somatic work and also relational. How do you really highlight, you know, how to bring in the healthy relational mm -hmm. to somebody that already believes that can't happen? You know, they have a right. conviction about the world and people that that's never going to work. So how do you gradually open that up to where they are willing to take a risk in a very gentle way and an effective way? That's what I'm really trying to keep learning and deepening in the work that I'm teaching therapists is, is that, how to do that, right? And we have to do our own work to be able to do that, frankly. Oh, Almost you bet. Definitely. You yeah. know, we can't just pretend because the whole thing's based on attunement and authenticity. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know? Yeah. No, most definitely. I think it's, it's irresponsible to be a therapist and not do your own work. I kind of feel like we need to do more therapy than even our clients, you know, because we're getting exposed to so many different people and their That's issues. True. It's not just our own histories. We're, yeah. you know, courageous enough to be intimately, deep, deeply connected to maybe 25, 30 people a week in all their struggles, you know. So we, in a way, are challenging ourselves to be, I don't know, uh, eight octave people in a one octave world. I mean, it's there's a lot that yeah. 
that we're challenged by. So I think it's to have a compassionate safe haven for therapists is another, uh, another goal of mine, you know, in our workshops is to let people dive deep in and with other professionals and just to learn that. And we're, you know, we're making this available to the public too, in, in another way. And we're moving in that direction. Yeah. Oh, it's so important information. So what about the ambivalent? Ambivalent has a different challenge. You know, very often there's a kind of some good love in their parenting experience, but it's highly inconsistent. So as soon as they start to relax into the nourishment, kind of the rug gets pulled out because often they have parents. Remember, parents learned their attachment styles intergenerationally. So it's in a way sure. nobody's fault. You got to go all the way back to the caveman. But the but but in our generation, you know, fortunately, we have had this explosion of therapy and explosion of understanding and research that we've had a lot of support to be able to go in and heal our histories if yeah. we choose to. And our parents very often didn't have that privilege, uh, that possibility. It just didn't exist. So a lot of them didn't know how to correct it, and they maybe did the best they could, but they still came up maybe a significantly short in the way they were uh guided to raise kids or they just did what their parents did and you know whatever injuries just kind of went down through the generations but in ambivalent usually there's an inconsistency and unpredictability so um there's always a worry like when's my parent going to be there when are they not going to be there and even when so then later if you're insecure constantly of like is this person going to be consistent enough you start Paint, watching them all the time, like, are they here? Are they not here? And even when they are there, you're waiting, go, well, yeah, they're here now. But the classic thing for ambivalence is yes, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, even as they might say to you as a therapist or as a friend or as a partner, yeah, yeah you're here today, but what about tomorrow, oh, right? right? There's this kind of expectation for chronic disappointment. So they tend to mm -hmm. complain. Yeah. You know, even before something happened, they're already ready to complain about it before you even disappointed them because they're sure you're going to disappoint them, you know? Yeah. And the problem with that is, is, is because they're, you got kind of an external target for getting yourself regulated. You think the only way you can get regulated is through somebody out there. It can result in, as you're an adult, a lot of pressure on the partner. Like, you have to make this right for me, or you have to do this, or you have to do that, in a way that really isn't true. It's, it's not a true mutuality. It's a, it's a feeling that I can't self-regulate myself. Now, that's not intentional. Just like avoidance, it's not intentional that they tend to over-focus on self and under-focus on the other. The opposite is true in ambivalent. They tend to over-focus on the other and, and not really have a feeling of self, not have a feeling of, of I'm here and I can self-regulate and if you're not available, I can manage. You know, There's this um, kind of over-focus on trying to have the external world uh, make things work. Now, the, the paradox in that is that very often they, they because they're so sure and sometimes really angry at, before even anything even happens, it's because they're so sure you're going to drop the ball. Oh. And depending on how much that happened as a kid, they'll either feel sadness. If it happened a lot, they'll feel angry. And a lot of times they can't explain why they're always angry and their partner's befuddled about why they're angry all the time. <laughs> and... Um, so one of the things they need is reassurance and consistency and, um, you know, only until they get enough feeling about the relationship that secure attachment can happen. You know, a lot of these patterns don't get triggered till you're in the relationship for about a year, year and a half, sometimes yeah. two years, because your attachment system has to feel like you're a significant person in the other person's life, whether it's your therapist or your marriage, right, or your dating partner who, or maybe even a best friend. It's when you start to be perceived as permanent that these issues start to surface. Yeah. So they don't always happen at the very beginning. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And in ambivalent, it's interesting. There's a lot of fear of abandonment. There's mm -hmm. a lot of feeling sometimes of being intruded upon. And th there's a lack of object constancy. Now, that's a psych psychobabble word. But what that basically means is when you're younger, um, you know, one, two years old, one of the ways we manage our primary caregiver coming and going is we build an internal image inside of ourselves and we can like you know used to, in the very beginning if your mom walks into the kitchen you think she disappeared like she doesn't exist anymore as a baby right, right. but as you build object constancy she can walk into the kitchen and you're holding an image of your mom or your dad inside yourself that you're relating to while they're gone and you begin to develop a trust that they're going to come back because they keep coming back but because in ambivalent the parents been so inconsistent very often there's not this confidence built 
from having an internalized sense of object constancy. So one of the things you're trying to reinforce when you're correcting this is that sense of things. And the other thing is, is that uh, ambivalence, as much as they long for relationship and also have this disabling fear of losing it, they often... Um, don't notice caring behaviors. It's a paradox. Wow. So a lot yeah. of times you can be dumping caring behaviors on one of your friends or your yeah. partner or your, you know, whatever, but the person isn't, they're almost like Teflon to it because yeah. here's the deal. If they receive good contact, then it triggers them back into the, inco- that, that, that it's not going to last. So it comes like a package deal, like, okay, I get love, but it's going to go away. I get love, it's going to go away. And as in therapy or in healing, we have to separate those two ideas. Mm-hmm. I had a woman in Germany um, that was really interesting. She said she always dates these unavailable men. And I, and I, I and she said, they last two years, you know, which is kind of like when the attachment system gets going, right? And then they're so disappointing, I leave. And I've done this for like five times. And I said, well, that's interesting because I started to think, well, maybe a ambivalent attachment. And I said, tell me a little bit about this guy you're in a relationship with now. Does he do anything that's nurturing? And she goes, well, he travels all the time. He's never here. He's never around. And I said, but you didn't really answer my question. Does he do anything? That's caring. And she's like thinking, kept saying no. And I said, well, look at it again. And she said, well, you know, he travels, but he always brings me a special gift. I said, well, that's kind of nice. And she goes, yeah, funny. I didn't even think about that. I said, is there anything else? And she goes, well, he likes to take me at least once, one weekend a month to some really nice pl- weekend away, some really beautiful place. And because we don't get that much time together. I said, well, that's kind of nice. And, you know, this goes on and on to about there's like five different things that he does that are really the calls her every night, all these different things. And she's like being shocked every time she realizes one of these things yeah. because there's this tendency to not be able to receive because yeah. it takes you into the abandonment. Yeah. So she started to be able to receive and she walked out of that session, one session. She walked out of that session. He goes, oh, my God, this guy's really great. But she had no awareness of that before. I think yeah. he was really happy we had that session. I'm sure yeah, when he got home. Yeah. So you're looking at how do you correct these belief systems that come from really early on that people don't even remember or have yeah. a story about and and helping them come back to secure attachment. That's the whole idea. So mm-hmm. we can come back and live more from that perspective. But we need a little rearranging first and it's possible. Yeah, that's that's again such such a wonderful way to put it. So tell us a little bit about the disorganized, which we know as therapists are the most difficult people to work yeah. with. And, and unfortunately, out there, people also find them very difficult to, to relate to and to be with and, and don't know how to deal with them a lot of the time. Yeah, the d- disorganized, and sometimes it's called disoriented, is the most challenging to yeah. live out and to, to mm-hmm. also work with. And sometimes, I just want to say, so, many of us have like a situational disorganized mm-hmm. where so we're not like chronic, some, pe- some of us are chronically disorganized, but some of us, it's just like one certain thing will trigger us yeah. into disorganized, just one event. And it's not our whole life, right? We might be mostly avoided or mostly ambivalent or mostly secure. And then a certain search situation, like maybe illness, uh, because your parent, you know, had to go to the hospital when you were a kid and it took you into abandonment, just any kind of illness might trigger you into this fragmentation. So it doesn't always have to be the whole picture. And sometimes you're more disorganized and avoidant or more disorganized uh, ambivalent. So there's different mm-hmm. ways, you know, to really understand more precisely what's going on for someone. Um, that said, the general thing is, is that you've got, we're biologically designed to connect, right? Um, but if your parent has unresolved trauma and they're just still scared, maybe they're not doing anything scary necessarily, but they're emanating kind of a field of fear or chaos, you can't connect with that. It'll trigger your instinctive threat response to get away because fear triggers our threat, our fear reaction, right? The amygdala gets firing and uh, the alarm goes off. So, um, so it, and then of course it can also be that your parent does certain scary things like yelling or, um, you know, uh, could be in the worst case abuse, physical, sexual, emotional mm-hmm. abuse could be, you know, mm-hmm. anything that's driving recklessly, addiction. Mm-hmm. There's lots of ways that could be scary. So the challenge is you've got two really strong biological uh, instincts at cross purposes. So one part wants to bond, one part wants to get away or, or to hit or to or goes into freeze, right? It's mm-hmm. related to the threat. So we're trying to untangle this um, overcoupled response of threat and attachment. And that's at the core of what's going on for disorganized. And actually, people will feel physiologically disorganized. It's a little bit like if you were trying to drive your car 
forward with the you know foot on the gas pedal and trying to put the brakes on at the same time you 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 know you're just kind of in a stuck in approach avoidance you know you're just like trying to approach but then you're trying to avoid and mm-hmm. and it's very difficult in relationships of course when that's happening mm-hmm. creates a lot of pain and suffering that isn't about the relationship that's yeah. one of the values of understanding attachment theory is that probably they say literally think about this 90 to 95% of what's going on in our significant relationships is about our attachment history. I mean, if even half of that is true. I didn't know it was that high. Oh, my goodness. I know. And I said, okay, that sounds really high. But I'm like, even if it's 50%, I mean, who cares? Even if it's 50%. Yeah. I mean, that's something that we need to know because we're projecting so much on our partners. It has nothing to do with them and creates all this unnecessary suffering. And I think we deserve more love and more pleasure in our life. So that's one of the reasons I love understanding attachment theory. Yeah. Well, and and I think everybody everybody wants that, you know, but it's so interesting because in – viewing, especially when I see couples through the attachment filter, when they're telling me what they argue about, Mm -hmm. I, I can almost guess. And most of the time, I guess correctly what their childhoods were like. And, and Mm -hmm. if mom or dad did something significant just by what they argue about or how they react to things, you know, the the presenting Mm -hmm. problem that they come in. It's like a fractal, you know, the pattern just keeps regenerating relationally. And, but if people can understand it and unwind it, right. And clear it, then they have all this potential for love and enjoyment and pleasure and, you know, containing difficult stuff that happens in life too, but being able to be resilient, recover faster. I mean, there's just endless benefits to getting our, our true nature, our true secure attachment back on board where it's in a practical way, really active in our lives. Yeah. I'm just curious, does a disorganized ever choose as a partner a secure attachment? Well, you know, I th- absolutely can happen. I, I talked to Amir Levine uh, a couple weeks ago to interview for my program, and he wrote the book uh, with Rachel Heller called it Attached. And what, one of the things he's doing in his private practice in New York is he's running groups for people with all different attachment disruptions on how to date. I love this. Oh, wow. And he's having people, instead of like selecting for, oh, we both love volleyball or we're both Republican or we're both Hindu or we're both whatever, (laughs) instead of going for that, he's like trying to help people shape their questions when they date to find securely attached partners. Because he said the easiest way, the fastest way out of all of this is to find a securely attached partner. And there's around 45 to 50 percent of the population, that's a lot of people, that have secure attachment. He says it takes, they say in in the research, it takes two to four years if you have a disrupted attachment, even if it's disorganized, for you to move deeply towards secure if you have a secure partner because they're responding to you constantly, you know, and hopefully therapists are presencing secure attachment, but your partner is constantly in everyday life, you know, you're living with this person, they're constantly reacting from a healthy place. So eventually your, your attachment system gets it. You know, that they're not going to be abandoning. They're not going to be attacking during a conflict. They're not going to, you know do something abusive they're, they're not going to be neglectful or still faced or you know vacate or whatever and it that's what I mean that's what's so cool this is a relationally um, sensitive to the relational environment so, so yes so anybody let, can hunt down securely <laughs> yes, hunt down that's so fun <laughs> hunt down. well so let me ask you this Search, not to you know? sound not to sound like the Debbie Downer of the group yeah. but why would a secure stay what I want to know. with, <laughs> with you know, an avoidant maybe, but but uh, a disorganized, for example, where their their reactions uh, seem to be so so um, you know reactionary. I, I can explain oh, it spiritually. Yeah. I can't understand why they would absolutely do it. Um, because if I saw that, I might run. <laughs> but I would say well, spiritually... Always, you know, there's different it, levels of everything, too. Oh, oh know, absolutely. Yeah, of course, of case course. And a severe but case. But spiritually, it could be, you know, their um, their contract, their spiritual contract on the other side. Yeah, that's and true. And it could that's say, true. look, I'm going to come in this way. You, you've got these things you're going to have to deal with, and uh, I'm going to help you. Yeah. I've seen it happen. I've yeah. seen it in my practice where there's one really stable person that, you know, that just, you just think, wow, you know, and this other person that's really struggling. And... It works, you know. So wow. I think sometimes it can be challenging to the other way too, to be realistic. Yeah. But I, I do think um, getting therapy with the people that understand trauma and attachment can be 
unbelievably helpful and it can be really efficient if the person understands attachment theory and somatic work. I think both of those are really, I'm biased. I mean, that's, I, I'm biased in that direction because I, I just see how well that works, but I, yeah, there yeah. may be other things that, you know, work too. Um, and then, and then what kind of people you surround yourself with. I mean, mm -hmm. as we move back to secure attachment, we start to be able to recognize who can really be in our life that's supportive and empowering? And we start stop chasing True. people that are constantly hurting us. I mean, I, I mean, even myself, I like, oh gosh, it was 15 years ago now. It was around the year 2000, I remember. I kind of did a garage sale on all my relationships. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a funny, oh, I just was a personal decision. I don't know whether anybody else would want to do this, but I kind of went through it. I went like, okay, which of these relationships am I really obsessing about? And they're constantly painful. And why am I putting energy into that? And geez, here's over here, are these people that are really amazing and empowering. And, you know, maybe I'll put some more energy into that. You know, so I, I kind of had a, an awareness of like, I think I'm going to choose, you know, I'm going to make a choice about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I, I, it was a great journey. It was a really, really helpful. So I think, there's all these things at play, you know, and sometimes you have somebody in your life, maybe it's a relative or someone that, you know, you just can't stop putting energy into that relationship because maybe it's one of your children, you know, you, you want to stay connected. So you're really working to help that healing happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also really beautiful. It's yeah. interesting, though. I mean, I think for, I mean, work to me is so much simpler than oh, yeah. really being uh, highly skilled and re and resilient in relationship. So I, I don't know. For me, that's, you know, Dan Siegel actually said that. He said, you know, we're pretty good at understanding emotion and cognition and, you know, even awareness of awareness. I mean, deep yeah. spiritual states. But what really he felt, and I have to say I agree, the frontier for humanity right now is really learning how to connect. Yeah. to ourselves you in bet. a really deeply authentic way and to other people in a really nourishing and healthy way. Well, I think it's, it's big. Yeah, it, it's huge. I think it's what we want to do the most and sometimes for some people, the, the scariest thing for them. I think, I that's think interesting. it's one of the hardest, hardest things. I think for people to be really intimate and connected is, I think, is probably scarier than their fear of death. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, or public you know. speaking. I'll, I'll agree to you on that one. And that's yeah. the one thing you can't get through the Internet is touch, as you were saying earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so, touch, I, mean, touch, touch. I mean, everything is missing other than yeah. touch. Oh, yeah. Right? I, mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Everything is there except touch yeah. is what I'm trying that's to say. That's probably yeah. what they'll create next. Yeah. You know, some kind of virtual reality, you know. <laughs> they are, but, actually. They're working on it right now. But we need the real now. thing, yeah. you know. Creepy. Yeah. We need the real thing. But, well, well, I've always said, you know, I mean, the, 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 the invention of email and text was like heaven for avoidance for me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. You know, well, and, you it, know and, um, and it's hell uh, for ambivalence. According to Amir Levine, that Internet dating is a heaven for avoidance because they yeah. can connect in a way that's disconnected. Wow. And he said that the Internet dating world, he I has some statistics on this, that it's heavily populated with people that are avoidant. <laughs> So mm -hmm. because people go in and out of relationships sometimes quickly, they, yeah. they switch, you know, yeah. I mean, some people find their everlasting partner on the Internet, too, which is great. Yeah. But there but there's a lot of um, avoidance seem seem to recover faster from breakups than an ambivalent might. Right. Mm -hmm. Because ambivalent is so externally oriented. But the thing that's really true that people don't recognize about avoidance, I kind of feel like avoidance need, you know, somebody to stand up for them because they get a little bit trashed, even in the lit literature, um, is that. They may initially feel relief when they lose a partner, like a separation, mm -hmm. elation. Mm -hmm. But once they realize it's a permanent loss, they go into a deep, often a deep depression, oh, wow. a deep sense yeah. of terrible loneliness. Yeah. Um, yeah. They want connection. They just have to have the right way to, they're sort of, I don't know, scuba diving. If you think about going deep, they're going deep into their own world. And they need time to surface. And when they s actually do surface, they need to be met with something that's really nourishing and reinforcing. And then they need to get used to that, mm -hmm. uh, that risk and to take that challenge and to find that to be more normal than, than being rejected or having somebody not be present. And they're very sensitive to disconnection. So if, if a partner really understands that or a therapist really understands that, they can help them navigate that. It gives them a big chance to come back towards secure. Yeah. And they want, they love, often they really love their partners, but their partners don't feel loved. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But they actually do really love their partners. They oh, just yeah. don't express it in a way where the other person feels it very much. And then that, of course, affects the person, the, the partner's attachment system where they start to shut down. And so a lot of this, if it can be explained in a compassionate way and people can start to practice secure attachment skills, like an avoidant mm -hmm. can practice approach and kind of practice mm -hmm. engaging, even if they do it like two or three times a day more than they used to do it. Mm -hmm. And they find out that it isn't met with rejection and actually 
they like it a little bit, then they can start to move uh, successfully back to secure. Yeah, no, that that's the beauty of it. I mean, I wish we had hours and hours to talk I about know. this. But I you know. have a free attachment quiz that our listeners oh, who yes. are curious to begin to explore what their attachment might be at your uh, on your website, correct? Right. So it's dianepoolheller.com. And let me yep. spell it. It's D-I-A-N-E-P-O-O-L-E-H-E-L-L-E-R.com, dianepoolheller.com. Uh, for a free attachment quiz. And also, you want to give our listeners a lot of wonderful three, free things. So, uh, John, why don't you Yeah, tell you can listeners. text your email to 310-627-2250. Again, 310-627-2250. You got it on the screen there as well. And um, be sure to text your email address to Diane. And Diane, and you'll get an article called Navigating the Labyrinth of Love that goes into this material a little bit deeper. And uh, I have time to soak it up by reinforcing it through the reading and then some video clips on uh, different elements of what we've been talking about today to reinforce your understanding. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for gifting our listeners this. And I just want to go over really quickly the things that you're doing, some uh, events that you're doing. The D.A.R.E. training, Module 1 for L.A., which I will be there. Is oh, October 23rd through the 26th, and you can go yes. on uh, Diane's website to find out more about that. There's Just go th- under, under workshops and, and say Dare One, and you'll see the LA information. Mm-hmm. October 23 to 26, exactly. I'm so glad you're going to be there. That's great. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, the Therapist Mastermind Circle, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about that? That's a monthly program that's a closed group that we do. I do uh, t- uh, two 90-minute calls a month, and one is on uh, some teaching about all of this and then uh, kind of how to work with ourselves and work with our clients if we're therapists. Uh, so practical people can write in questions or send in case consults or send in situations they want me to address. And we've gone into some really interesting and really challenging situations. And there's a community. Everybody's online, and they can talk to each other, and they can talk to me, and, answer, and uh, it's really great. And we interview the person that, that sent in the information. And then we also have an expert interview once a month on an expert in the field that's kind of sharing their perspective because I love collaboration. I love to see people in their mastery, and we get a chance to interview some really great folks. Peter Levine, you know, uh, also just really wonderful yeah. uh, interviews we've had so far. Anna Chitty, Ray Castellino, um, my gosh, John Howard, lots of folks, Terry Real, uh, experts on couples work, experts on individual work, experts on trauma, uh, all these sorts of things. And then uh, we also have demos of me like working with people so you can kind of see the work in action. And we're just trying to give you, you know, handouts and quick start tips and all sorts of things to help it be easier. And that's a monthly program. And we open it usually about twice a year. Uh, we opened it in um, May and we're going to open it again, I believe, uh, in August. So if you go to my website, dianepoolheller.com, and you sign up for the newsletter, uh, just put your name in. If, and the newsletter gives you a bunch of free stuff, interviews, and, you know, if you want that. And then it'll also give you a chance to see what we're doing next. And then in September, we have a really exciting um, psychotherapy summit that I'm co-hosting with Sounds True out of Colorado. We're neighbors in Louisville. And uh, we have 15, uh, 14, 15 experts from Dan Siegel, uh, Rick Hansen, Ron Siegel, Michelle Werner Davis, who wrote Divorce Busters, Terry, uh, let's see, um, you have Bonnie, Bill, a bunch of people. I mean, it's all on yeah. the, on the, on the way, it'll be on the newsletter. And then we also have Mastering Attachment that is kind of taking people through these attachment repairs to learn secure attachment starting in October. So we've just got all sorts of fun stuff. We're trying to, you know, be kind of a, I don't know, sort of a connection place for good stuff to go out and life-affirming work and support everybody's work that is revolutionary in this field. And there's so many people out there that are doing great stuff, and I just love being part of that. So, Well, thank you so much. I mean, the world needs people like you to help start healing. You bet. So we're well, so just like happy. you guys are doing, Kelly and Shirley. You're <laughs> doing, it's great getting work. all this out there. It's beautiful. Well, we're just happy to, yeah, be the conduit to yeah. bring it out there. So thank you. Yay. Thanks so much, Diane. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Diane. Have a great uh, afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks so much. All righty. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks for listening. Are you guys still there?
You've been listening to Both Sides Now, featuring the unconventional duo Dr. Shirley and Kelly White. Two perspectives, one world. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, and... Thanks for listening. This is Dr. Shirley. And Medium Kelly White. Have a good day.